Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. It's a little bit better. Good. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your Christmas time together. Family, friends, good food. I think you all look well fed. Nicely done. Thank you, you guys. I've been begging these guys to show up this morning. They woke up. I'm very thankful you guys are here. Well done. It's not easy when you're in college and you're having to get here at 930 from a... Thank you guys. That means a lot. Um, I want to... Uh, I want to start by talking about one of my favorite book series. When I was younger, I picked up this book series, and my parents, they didn't know what they started. They gave me this first book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I remember reading this book, and I remember thinking, oh, if only God was like Aslan. He's so kind, and he's so loving. If only God was like Aslan. And then the more I understood God, the more I read my Bible, I was like, you know what? God is an awful lot like Aslan. And then as I began to understand symbolism and all these interesting literary terms, allegory, narrative, I began to realize that C.S. Lewis, he was a pretty bright guy. He took this, this seven-book series for children, and he taught them all about the great controversy, who God is, who he isn't. And then for us adults, when we read it, we're like, oh, that's clever. I see what you did there, Lewis. It's brilliant. Brilliant stuff there. So every year I pick these books up and I read them. Ashlyn has the um, audio version, the, the dramatic version of children reading it, and it's just so exciting to listen to. And she will talk about Aslan. And I'll say, you know who that is, right? It's Jesus. Yeah. And he loves you. I know. But you can't tame him. That's what she'll tell me. You can't tame him. One of my favorite themes, recurrent ideas in this book series is that Aslan is on the move. This phrase over and over again, Aslan is on the move. Anytime God's people begin to question where he is, if there is a long extended winter and no Christmas, can you imagine that? If you're living in Michigan, which I lived in for a long time, you needed something to look forward to, right? (sighs) You walk outside and your nostrils freeze up. You're like, Girl! <laughs> uh, Christmas. But again, God's people always, God is on the move. Look, watch what he's doing. God is on the move. At the very end of this book series, there's this book called The Last Battle. I picked it up this, this past week. And I started reading through it. And as I was reading, I picked up some beautiful things. I want to just share with you before we really get into this. At the very end of this book, what happens is there's this gorilla ape guy that he decides he's going to pretend he's Aslan. And he stays in this manger, and he tells all the people to go get him fruit and go do these things, and he's a pretty ruthless god. He's pretending to be Aslan. At the end, though, Aslan comes in, whoops up on Tosh, the pretend god, just destroys him. And then Aslan does this. He opens up the manger where all this was taking place. And as he opens it up, everyone looks in, and they see through the manger door, there is a new Narnia, a bigger world. And Aslan says this. He says, follow me further up and further in. And the people say, oh, further up, further in. Okay, and they all begin to go through the door, except for the dwarves. The dwarves go up to where the manger is. They sit in the manger, and they get in a circle, and this is what they do. Oh, boy, it's really stinky in here, isn't it? It's not much better than Narnia. Maybe a little bit better, but not much. And their eyes are closed. Aslan and the unicorn and all these other characters, they say, come with us. Come further up, further in. Oh, no, we'd much. It's safer here. And they stay there. They never grow. They never move past this infant understanding of Narnia. They stay there in the manger. Whereas Aslan and the others, they continue going deeper and deeper into the kingdom of heaven, what they call new Narnia. And they realize that the deeper in you go and the further up you go, the bigger it is. I want to share with you one of my favorite lines from this beautiful book. It goes like this. About half an hour later, or it might have been half a hundred years later, for time there is not like time here, Lucy, one of the, again, you all know Lucy. Raise your hand if some of this is resonating. You know what I'm talking about. Lucy. Okay, good. Lucy, one of the most beloved characters. Lucy stood there with her dear friend, 
her oldest Narnian friend, the fawn, Mr. Tumnus. A couple of you, good, good, good. Looking to see, you're probably with me. You're like, ah, oh, Tumnus. It's beautiful. <laughs> Looking down over the wall of that garden and seeing all Narnia spread out below. But when you looked down, you found that this hill was much higher than you had thought. It sank down with shifting cliffs thousands of feet below them. And trees in that lower world looked no bigger than grains of green salt. Then she turned inward again and stood with her back to the wall and looked at the garden. I see, she said thoughtfully. I see now this garden is like the stable. It's far bigger inside than it was outside. Think of that. Huge. He's talking about the Christian journey here. Of course, daughter of Eve, said the fawn, the further up and the further in you go, the bigger everything gets. Think about heaven, if we considered heaven that way. Not just some place where we're sliding down giraffes' necks. That's weird anyways. Imagine heaven. The deeper and the further in we get to understanding God, the bigger he is. Yeah? Let me give you more. I see, she said, this is still Narnia, and the more real and the more beautiful than the Narnia down below, just as it was more real and more beautiful than Narnia outside the stable door. I see world within world, Narnia within Narnia. Here's my favorite line of all. Yes, said Mr. Tumnus, like an onion, except that as you continue to go in and in, each circle is larger than the rest. Here's the deal. Packy's gone. He had too much to eat. His legs couldn't handle it. We're going to fix him up. But here's the deal. A lot of us, our faith and our faith and our understanding and our journey with God. He opened up the stable door. We experience Christmas and we see him as an infant and it's beautiful. But Jesus says, come with me now on this journey. Go further up, further in with me. Let's grow Let's not let this faith be stagnant. Stable people are scary to me. And I'm not just talking about in a stable. I'm talking about people that think they know everything. They got it all together. They stop questioning. Those people terrify me. They start defending scripture rather than defending people like Jesus did. Further up, further in is what we should be doing. The elephant in the room is that a lot of us, we never left the manger. God is calling us to live further up and further in, grow with him in our life, in our journey. And as we go deeper in our relationship with him, he gets bigger and bigger, and the more questions we have, amen? Some of us stopped asking questions faithfully to God. And we just sat there in our circles like the dwarves, and we said, well, this is enough. It's good. Where Jesus has been calling you to live further up, and further in. And so today, I'm going to take you through another idea that's going to bring us further up and further in. We talked about prayer, right? How important prayer is. That we not only talk, but we listen. That we experience it daily with him. We experience that as a community. Prayer is so important. I gave you the Lord's Prayer Challenge, and five of you did it. <laughs> this week, we're going to do something different. All of you will do it, correct? Amen? I want to see you all shake your head. Then I'm going to call you on it. There we go. Good. Talked about all these elements. Today we're going to talk about simplicity. Interesting that this would come after Christmas, right? Simplicity, after the most chaotic time of the year. Let me show you a video real quick. Simplicity. So this couple, by the way, does this terrify some of you? You're like, what? That big? How many of you would feel a little bit claustrophobic? Tiny bit. This couple, what they decided to do was to reorganize their whole lives. They wanted to begin to live simply. So they had to, again, look, look at everything they thought they needed and reassess it. What do I need versus what do I want? I think one of the biggest issues in our culture, especially during Christmas time, yes, we... Praise the Lord for baby Jesus. And we talk about baby Jesus and we sing about him. But what happens often is most of us are more excited about Christmas morning when we get gifts. And then after all the gifts are there, you realize you have no room. And so what do you need to do? Well, you need to break down that wall and build a bigger because you need more stuff and more room for your junk. 
our biggest issue in our culture right now is that we have lives that are chaotic and they're filled with clutter. So much clutter that when Jesus says, I should be the center of your life, we're like, yeah, but I'd rather have you in that box over there. Because the center of my life is my job, is this, it's my iPhone, it's Facebook. What do you spend your time on? What is the center of your life? Most of us, we clutter our lives with so much stuff. And no wonder we burn out so quickly. Some of you right now, you came to church and you are burnt out. You're so, your life is so filled with so much clutter. God is saying you need to simplify. How many of you have ever found yourself saying this? I need this. Raise your hand. Come on, you guilty sinner. I need this. I say all the time, and Daniel gets so frustrated with me. Daniel, I need this. She's like, you need it? You're going to preach about this this week. You, you don't need it. <laughs> How rude. I need it. Daniel and I once, we had a, we, we were living in Colorado, and I had just gotten into a car accident, totaled the car. The only car we had was, I called it the Malibu Barbie Mobile. It was this white RAV4 cute looking thing. Four cylinders of power. If you push too hard, the battery or the, the, the rubber band might snap inside. So I'm driving it and I just disliked it. I thought everyone was looking at me funny. When I would drive by, I immediately thought, they're judging me. I need a manly car. I need four wheel power as I'm going through the mountains on expeditions like I ever did this. But I start looking on Craigslist, eBay, and Danielle's like, oh no, here he goes. I find the perfect vehicle that I can actually trade, pretty much straight up trade. So I go and we trade it in, and as we're pulling out of the parking lot, I've got this full leather sunroof, this trooper, it's manly a trooper. What do you drive? I don't drive a Malibu Barbie vehicle. I drive a trooper. Because that's what I am. A trooper. I'm a soldier. So we're driving. And as we're driving, all of a sudden, no lie, two miles down the road, beep, 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 beep. I'm like, what is the check engine light doing, Danielle? Sweetie, that's not good. Yeah, what does that mean? It means there's something wrong with the engine. No. It can't be. We just bought it. As we go further down, it starts looking like a Christmas tree. <laughs> cheepa, 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 cheepa. Torque on demand, going out, this, 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 this. It ended up being a bit of a lemon. We put thousands and thousands of dollars into this car because what? I had to have it. I needed this thing. I needed the troopers so that I could look like a soldier and not Barbie, not Malibu Ken. And so... When Jesus, when Jesus is not my center and I start feeling like I need, need, need these other things to be happy, you end up going down gnarly roads, don't you? They're ugly and they're gross and we end up in a lot of pain and we end up spending a lot of money and it gets bad. Finance is one of the main reasons people divorce. Imagine this guy buys a car, can't afford it. He's driving it, driving it, can barely make the payments. Then he gets into an accident. And then the medical, medical bills get bad. And before you know it, everything falls apart. We all know these stories. Some of it's happened to you. What if we could just stop and simplify? Just for a minute. Simplify. Jesus says often in scripture, well, a lot of us get this idea, well, Jesus is in, he's not interested in economics. He's not interested in how we spend our money or what we value that much. It's kind of a do your own thing. He actually is very interested. I want you to check this out. We're all, we're all about ownership. But look at uh, Leviticus 25, 23. The land must not be sold permanently. Wouldn't that be interesting if we actually lived like that? It's not sold permanently because the land is mine. And you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Imagine if we believe that today. How would we treat oil and water and other resources? God looks down and, you know, we're selling water. He's like, why are you selling my water? It's free. No, but Dasani, it has this really greasy taste that I like going down my throat. Dasani. It's like, dude, it's water. I gave it to you as a gift. 
How would we treat our resources if we understood they weren't ours? The year of jubilation, the Jews kept this. Seven years would go by, and then on the seventh year, the year of jubilation, all of your debt was canceled. College students, amen? We're going to do that from now on. Just kidding. I wish I could. But it would be beautiful, wouldn't it? All of your debt, all of your debt canceled. We start over again because the land is God's. Everything is his. They would do this. Uh, we're Adventists, right? We pride ourselves that we have a day of jubilation, don't we? A day of jubilation. We get together once a week and we kind of get back in rhythm again. That's what we're supposed to do. But here's the rumor that I've heard. Some churches, not ours, of course. Not ours. Some churches... On Sabbath, what they do is they decide to put all of their meetings, all of their work, everything into one day on Sabbath, their day of jubilation. And what a lot of people do, not us of course, but the day of jubilation becomes a day of slavery and you walk away exhausted. I can't wait till Sabbath is over. I'm so tired from jubilation. I was jubilating too hard. It makes sense. We miss the mark. We need to simplify. Our Sabbath needs to be simplified. We need to stop and say, Lord, I want to get back in rhythm with you again. I want to be with you. I want to simplify my day. May I spend time with my community for a bit, a little bit, because they drive me crazy. I've been with them all week. A little bit. Let me praise and worship with them. And let me get out into nature and enjoy my family and enjoy the gifts you've given me. What if Sabbath looked like that? You might be willing to invite someone to church if that happened, wouldn't you? Because there was actually something happening afterwards. Yeah, year of jubilation. Year of jubilation. Proverbs 11.28. Proverbs 11.28. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive. I love that word, thrive. They will thrive like a green leaf. If you put all of your all of your energy, everything, all of your happiness into what you own, you will find yourself devastated when you lose it. Totally devastated. Am I saying that money is wrong to have? No. I'm saying if you're putting all of your happiness into what you own, the things that you're accumulating, when it is gone, you will be devastated. What is left? If Jesus isn't the center. What's left? You'll find your life beginning to decay. And it's ugly and it's sad. Jesus, he declares war on materialism. Luke 16, 13. Watch this. In the Aramaic culture, there's this word mammon. Everyone say mammon. We correlate this with money, but the actual word is even bigger than this. It's what owns you, what you serve. For the Jewish, the Jewish community, they understood that money often was something that they felt owned them. And so it just became this normal tradition. They would put money in, they would insert that for mammon. And Jesus says here, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You can't. You cannot have two things be number one in your life. You can't. It doesn't work. If you have to have all of these things to be happy, to give you an identity. I know people who grew up dirt poor and now they got their hands on some dough and they're so excited and they have to flaunt it to everybody. Hey, I'm a big deal. Let it rain. I'm a big deal. I'm a big deal. Look at me. You're not a big deal. You're a child. Your center is not Jesus Christ. And someday I pray that when you fall and when you lose that, that there will be a community to help you back up again. You can't serve two masters. Jesus says it's not, it's not money that's evil. It's the love of it. It's when you place that in place of God. Watch this. He speaks to the rich young ruler. How many of you know the story? This rich young ruler goes to Jesus and he says, Hey Lord, what can I do to inherit your kingdom? 
we understand that that was not speaking about heaven, some far off place. It was talking about how can I experience the kingdom that you keep talking about, that you're living, that you said is here now. How do I get that now? How do I get it? Jesus goes through the list because he knows this is what the man's looking for. All of us do this, don't we? What do I need to do this? What's the short, fastest thing I can do? Give me a devotional book. I need to get connected with Jesus. Give me the list of 10 things I can do. Oh, three? Better yet. Three? Perfect. It's a short read. So he gives him this list of commands. And the man says, oh yeah, I'm good at all of them. Jesus purposely leaves out one. He leaves out the one that is the issue for the man. He says, okay, well then go and sell all of your belongings. For the man, Jesus touches his heart. He says, I know what you've put in place of me. Let it go. Let it, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let me be center again in your life. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. If you want to experience heaven, the kingdom of God right now, if you want to go further up and further in, Jesus says we have to simplify. You have to allow him to be center. Those other things he will give you, right? He'll give you those things. Those things will come, but if he's not center, if you're not seeking first like Matthew 6, 25 through 33, seek first the what? The kingdom of heaven. And what? All those things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. If that's what you're doing, your life will be transformed. You won't need all the stuff to make you happy. Seeking God's reign in your life and all you do, constantly moving toward him will change your life. There are some things in your life right now that you have been just packing your life with, thinking they would make you happy. And a lot of us are worn out, we're tired, and we're realizing, man, I got the iPhone 12. I don't know how you got it. You got it. And now you're so happy. And it's going to last for three months until you realize, well, the galaxy looks a whole lot better. It's not going to make you happy. We need to learn to simplify. We no longer allow stuff to own us, to master us. And when we do that, when we allow Jesus to be center, powerful things happen. I want to take you through just a list of things I want you to try this week. I'm going to give you the simple challenge. Everyone say simple challenge. Simple challenge. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. If you don't, there will be bears that come in here and eat you. No, I'm kidding. Do it. Please. Please do it. It's a powerful, I, I would love to see all of you do it. I would love to have you post on Facebook and email me your responses to some of these things that we're going to try with this idea of simple, living the simple challenge. So let me go through a couple concepts I just want you to consider for a moment. Number one, when I simplify, buy things for their usefulness. A lot of us buy things because of the status, right? I don't shop there. I don't sh <laughs> we, do we are worfles. <laughs> we don't shop there. Buy it for its usefulness. Don't just, don't just go out and say, I need a Beamer. What do you need? Beamers are nice, by the way. I like them. But do you have to have the nicest, fanciest, everything? No, you don't need to. I'm speaking to a bunch of Orange County people, by the way, all of you on live stream, and I'll probably be crucified later. Do you need it? Do you have to have it? Do you have to buy this because of its status, or can you buy it for its usefulness first? Think usefulness. Number two, reject things that produce an addiction in you. I refuse to be owned by anything. This week, I'm going to do something different in my life, starting tomorrow morning, which is going to be a bear. Every morning when I wake up, I say this. I say this, I need coffee. I need it. Now, for me, it's not even coffee. It's just sugar and chocolate. I need sugar and chocolate because my drinks are frou-frou to the core. Put sprinkles and everything else beautiful and then a little umbrella and I'm golden. It's my frou-frou drink. I'll put my pinky up as I drink it. 
But I'm, I'm going to try this week to say, Lord, I need you to give me energy and strength. I want you to be my center. Do this for me. I don't want to be addicted and owned by this anymore. Develop a habit of giving things away. This is hard. Ashlyn, we went, we went to, uh, to go get some pho the other day, and her favorite thing after that is to get a boba drink. Ashlyn had some boba in the car, her favorite drink, and as we're driving, this homeless person walks up, and we're stopped at a light. He knocks on my window, and I'm like, what? This is my space. Get away. And so I roll down the window. I don't have any cash. I'm sorry. I don't carry it. I hear Ashlyn's window roll down. I'm like, Ashlyn! I look back, and Ashlyn, whoop, take my boba. This boba that she loves, take it. She gave away. She was so happy to give a gift to someone. Learn to give away something. You will find that when you give away something, oh, tremendously powerful things happen. Learn to give away something. Next, learn to enjoy things without owning them. Get a library card. Go to a park. Go to the beach and don't think, well, I need to own a piece of land here on the beach. Enjoy it. Just go and enjoy it. You don't have to. I know people that they'll buy gaming consoles and they'll invite all their friends and they'll create this beautiful community playing this gaming system. But what these fools do and what they don't understand is when they go and buy their own, they end up all by themselves eating popcorn and never moving and never actually communicating all that much with other people. Take advantage of your friend's gaming system. Go and play. Create community. You don't have to own it. Enjoy things without owning them. Another concept I want you to consider. Psalm 24.1 tells us that God is a God of creation. His creation is to be enjoyed. Go out in nature. It puts things in perspective. You see this huge mountain in front of you and you think, huh, I'm not that big. My problems aren't that big. You see a sparrow getting food and you realize, wow, he didn't have to go work. For, he didn't have to do all these things. He doesn't have an iPad. He still found it. How did he find it without GPS? Creation seems to simplify things for us, puts things into perspective. Another thing I want you to consider, consider your speech. Consider your speech. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be your yes be yes, your no be no. I got, a, I got a threatening email the other day from someone. Just, just a couple weeks ago, a threatening email. And I read that and I wanted to attack. I was like, you? Type in, type in, type in, type in, type in, type in, type in. Can't send. It's not godly. Can't send it. It's not very graceful. OC grace, except for now. Can't do it. Went back again, started typing. This time I'll use larger words. Maybe they won't understand my put downs. I can't do it. Finally, I was like, Lord, let my yes be yes, my no be no. I just wrote something short and sweet and to the point. And I actually asked God to help me mean it when I said, bless you. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Keep your words simple. Last thing I want to leave you with, reject things that breed oppression in others. Look at what you're buying. You know most of the coffee beans we get, there's slavery going on to give you those beans. Maybe we stop shopping at Mart of Wall. Maybe we start thinking about what we're buying and how it may be oppressing others. Maybe we can start making statements to companies who are using slavery in this world and let them know we don't accept it anymore. We can begin living simple. We do these things not so that we can get a golden ticket to heaven or that somehow I can become perfect. We do these things because we want to go further in and what? Further up, further in. I tricked you there. Say it with me. Further up and further in. That is what Jesus wants for us, to go further up and further in. He wants us to begin to experience the kingdom of heaven now. It starts with prayer, service, getting to know God's heart, beginning to live simply. You all have that blue sheet in front of you. Hopefully you were given it. If you weren't, go to the, the table over there. You'll get that blue sheet. 
Try this with me. Try this simple challenge this week. Try to live simply this week. Try these things. God is calling us to go further up and further in in our relationship with him. Will you join me? Three of you will join me? Yes. Will you join me? Yes. Going further up and further in with Jesus. Stand with me as we sing this last song.